particularly didn't fancy going into the army and I really wanted to be a pilot so I joined the Royal Air Force. I was 19 when I signed up uh, but they, they considered me to be too, old, too young to join. I think it was 20 before they called me. It was very interesting really because we were sent to London, England and into a re receiving place and um, I think there'd been some experience with pilots who had been in training who didn't have an aptitude to fly. So uh, part of the training, apart from the usual drill and ground, ground lessons and ground uh, work, you know, uh, we were sent to, to for six weeks to uh, training. After that, we went to what was known as a uh, I can't remember the name of it, but we were sent to a familiarization course and the rule there was that um, we had to go solo in 10 hours flying and this was to test to see if you had the aptitude because some people couldn't do it and there was no point in taking him for the rest of the training. So fortunately on the ninth hour I managed to go solo <laughs> and pass the test. So after that we were pushed around and around and around with no idea what was going to happen to us and um, in my, there was they were going to South Africa they were going to the US and my pleasant was uh, fact was I was sent to uh, Canada well I trained as a pilot in Canada so we went from Moncton to Alberta went to initial training school then to elementary flying training school and uh, the powers that be decided that I should probably be a flying instructor for a while. It was unfortunate really because it was a pretty tough existence but I, I saw I was an instructor uh, for 14 months, 15 months actually and from that point um, we, we went to operational training unit in, in British Columbia. I could fly before I could drive. I, <laughs> at 21, at the age of 21 I was a flying instructor and I was teaching people how to fly. Amazing when I look back, isn't it? <laughs> After we'd done the operational training uh, in, uh, in British Columbia, we went uh, on to twin-engined Mitchell aircraft and then uh, on to four-engined uh, B-24s, Liberator aircraft. And then it was decided that although we'd been promised home leave, that we weren't going to get it. We were going to fly to India. So we went to Montreal to pick up a brand new Liberator aircraft and two crews, my, myself and my crew and my very close friend and his crew took this Liberator on our own with one ha with help from a, um, a transport command uh, radio navigator to make sure we didn't get lost and we flew this, this brand new aircraft from Doval, Montreal to uh, all the way to India with stops on the way in Burma, we were right in them. We, we took, we actually moved into Burma to a, an airfield that had been run by the Japanese. And the army had moved them out, got rid of them, and we moved in with, the, with our aircraft. So they'd only just left and we got there. Well, if you remember that, you know, you're in a very bad living conditions uh, with, and, you know, you've got close friendship with all the men that are around you. And um, I was commissioned in the Air Force. I had my own servant. In, 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 even though we're in the jungle, I had a bear that used to come and make tea in the morning and take my clothes away and wash them. And my, I remember when I got home, my mother said, "Don't expect me to put fold your socks for you, you know, because <laughs> they would. These Indian bearers were. They could actually they could actually shave a man before he woke up in the morning. They were so good at that." And, uh, but they would, um, you know, wash, take away your, your, your dirty clothes and then they'd lay them out for you in the morning and the socks were all turned down so you could put them on with a minimum of effort. <laughs> so that was uh, part of the life there. Mm -hmm. That was a little bit of luxury compared, but we had, you know, we were living on us. Our beds were two by fours, four two by fours with rope across and that was our bed and a mattress. Mm -hmm. And then of course we had to have a mosquito net over us, so that's the way we lived. In Burma, we were living on the ground in tents, on tarpaulin, on the ground. Well, we just we were uh, doing our operational flying. We were, had some bombing runs to start with. Uh, we were, I think, our target was Bangkok. Was the first one. 
then uh, after that they uh, we were doing uh, rec reconnaissance flights uh, covering we were actually taking off we were flying 14 hours at, at the stretch and uh, this was reconnaissance over India Burma and Indochina and it was pre to prepare for what was to be the final push to get rid of the Japanese from that whole area mm -hmm. so we did that for about I think six weeks or eight weeks and then one day we heard that they dropped the bomb so we thought the war might be over but it, well, it wasn't we were still around you know so our next job was to drop supplies to the prisoners of war camps in in Burma which was a very you know good thing for us to do and it was uh, it was quite emotional really because we flew we we had a target place to find uh, make sure you know where the Japanese camp was and uh, then when we got there we had to make sure we got the right place and I remember on one occasion um, we uh, we weren't sure whether it was the right place so we somebody had a handkerchief and we put a little note in and, and a handkerchief with a, with a uh, some some weight and we dropped it over the camp and the note said is this the camp number so and so and if it is would you line up across the runway to make sure well you couldn't you couldn't have seen those fellows move fast quick so quickly you know they lined up across the runway <coughs> then of course the mistake was that now we couldn't drop the stuff because they were on the runway so we had to drop another message to say please clear the runway <laughs> so that happened on one occasion and after that we dropped you know two or three drops there that was a quite an interesting experience. Okay. One of the problems we had, and it's uh, probably digressing a bit, was that we had to drop rice to the Burmese. We were f briefing them food. And f some people decided that we could get off earlier in the morning if they put the sacks of rice in the aircraft at night. And there were some Japanese prisoners of war on our station, and they were husky people. They could pick up the sack of rice, and they were, so they loaded the aircraft. But what we didn't know was that there were rats inside those sacks. During the night, they came out. So we took off in the morning, and these rats were in the wings, and they were chewing into the uh, uh, um, control power lines. And all of a sudden, an engine went out. And uh, we dis they discovered it after a while, because the people, you know, you'd be flying on four engines, and suddenly you only got three. And then, then, you know, you got two, so they were coming back with two engines. So uh, they, we had to get a local rat catcher in there to get the rats. But my f close friend uh, was caught with that. He landed, he got, he had uh, all three engines pulled out, uh, ran out of them, and he crashed and killed himself and the whole crew. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was one. Mm -hmm. We have dropping rice. Now this is, you know, we're pushing sacks of rice into the Burmese jungle. And um, what we'd been doing it for about two weeks, and one day a Burmese man came into the camp on a camel. <laughs> and he had come all the way from that jungle that we were dropping it in by land. It had taken him two and a half weeks to tell us to be more careful where we were dropping the rice and to make sure there was nobody around when we dropped it. That's strange, wasn't it? Because wow. we never used to push the things out, you know, get rid of them and get back home. <laughs> the stories of the people in the jungle, are the, 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 the most heartbreaking stories are the ones of the Japanese prisoners who were caught in uh, Singapore and, and were paraded up through the jungle. That's, I think that's terrible stuff. I had a friend who was a pilot at our, on our squadron, he was a Scottish man, and he, had, he was a pilot in Singapore. And when the Japanese came in, he managed to get an old aircraft and he flew out. He escaped. I think there were two of them in there. He escaped. And he got, he got a job with the Air Force of the Squadron. And he was doing so. He did some operational flying. And then after he'd done his operational flying, he was just flying around. They, the story came that there were a whole bunch of Japanese prisoners of war were on a boat that was coming through Calcutta. So he took off and went down to Calcutta because he had some friends that were still prisoners and he'd heard that one of the two of them were going to be on this ship. And when he went, he was so upset with what he saw and the condition of these people. And when he came back, he just sat and drank for about a week 
and just kept himself away from anybody. He couldn't believe it. He was so distressed with the way these people had been treated and what was left of them. After the, all this uh, supply dropping and rice dropping, we were ch charged with the responsibility of flying gasoline into China. I, don't, I understand now, I think that uh, the Americans were trying to support Chiang Kai-shek, I think. The story we got was that, that uh, the Air Force was repaying the Americans for the gasoline we'd borrowed from them during the war, but that's what we did. So we, we've, and you've heard of the Himalayas, of the, uh, and uh, it's known as the hump, you know, it's, it's about 20,000 feet. So it's a very high area, and the wind and the monsoon weather there is just frightening. So my most frightening experience ever <laughs> was flying over one day, and we were in total blackout, we couldn't see anything. I'm flying on instruments, and the, we had a radar which picked up the storms, and you know, so you could watch and avoid them, because if you got into one of these storms, they But this particular day, uh, the, there was such a mess around, and we were, we were over the mountains, um, that uh, I missed it, or I didn't miss it, but we flew right into the center of this storm. Now bear in mind, I can't see anything, you know, we're flying on instruments, and all of a sudden, the aircraft was thrown up in the air, thrown to the side, dropped. All my instruments had what's known as toppled. So nothing, I couldn't see anything. I didn't know where I was, upside down. And that was a very frightening experience. I managed to, I managed to sort of, by the seat of my pants, assume I was standing, I was still upright, and managed to turn the aircraft to get out of this storm and did within about five minutes. But boy, I, we lost a lot of aircraft that way actually, more, more aircraft were lost in that area from the weather than from enemy action. <clears throat> the first day that we were flying the gasoline into China, I was the first crew to go over there with the idea of setting up accommodation in China, so I was the first crew over. We landed at this place called Tully Hall where we were supposed to pick up the gas, and when I arrived there, uh, um, an Air Force officer came out with a pad and said, okay, how many, uh, how much do you want? So I said, what do you mean? He said, well, how many cigarettes do you want? How much Pond's Cold Cream do you want? I said, we're dropping gasoline in China. Oh, he said, you're not transport command. Oh, forget it. No, I said, hey, wait a minute, what, what, what are you talking about? He said, well, this, what we do, he says, we sell you cigarettes at 100% load on the existing price, you take them to China and you sell them for double that price. <laughs> so I said to my crew, how much money have we got on price? They all raked, got all the money out, we bought some cigarettes and punch cold cream. Punch cold cream, believe me. So anyway, we were landing in China and we go down to Kunming and boy, what a market, what a black market there was there. We took the, they, they, it's true, we just, they, you could buy anything and sell anything there, you know. Amazing. A lot of pleasant experiences really, uh, mostly in Canada really. It was, I think in fact being here was a very pleasant experience. In fact arriving here was after blackout in England and shortage of supplies and uh, you know you couldn't get bananas, you couldn't get cream, butter, bacon and arriving in Moncton and be able to go downtown and have a banana split that was the that was the best thing that we ever happened to us in those days so that, I think was, was a pleasant experience really I got to leave I had a, uh, my mother's cousin lived in Hamilton so on one leave I came here but on another leave we were uh, we arrived in British Columbia and uh, they were backed up six weeks we just had two weeks leave and I'd been to Hamilton and so we get to British Columbia, they say, well, you've got to go and leave again. Well, I spent all our money. So they gave me, they gave us four weeks, no, three weeks pay and said, come back in three weeks. So we all hitchhiked, not all of us, a number of hitchhiked to Hollywood. So we hitchhiked, we had no money, so we, we, we did enough money to live on. So, they, so I, I and a friend of mine, well, about four or five of us, but we split up into groups of two. And we hitchhiked from Vancouver all the way down to Los Angeles. And when we got there, the, the American services, uh, the USO, I think USO, 
uh, that's the way we went, first of all, and they would give you a house to go and stay, and so we were, we ended up, uh, the two, I was with, I was with, we ended up with a, a Disney photographer's house, actually, in, in Los Angeles, and they were very, very nice people, people called, a fellow called Tappenbeck, very nice uh, older people, they, I think they're second marriage, but they're little, they had a baby, so they, they, we, they, we lived there. And then we'd go to the USO and then different ladies in, in Los Angeles and Hollywood were entertaining the troops. We had a blue uniform, so we were different from the Americans and we stood out a bit. So we had a lot of uh, entertainment. We looked after quite a bit there. As a matter of fact, I was uh, like, I kept in touch with these people. And about 25 years later, I was asked to go to a meeting in Los Angeles. So I was able to write to these people and say, you know, the, the life's turned its circle and I'm coming back to see you. And they were still alive and I was able to, to say hello to them again. They were to see me and they looked so different. But uh, I remember going back, it was a very nice thing to do. I know that five and a half years uh, in, the, in the Air Force took away the prime years of a young man's life, really. Uh, because, you know, uh, we, I missed it. We, when I got home, of course, there was nobody left, you know, everybody had gone, and it was really a very difficult time. But I think it, it certainly made, made me into a man. You know, I think I matured very quickly during the Air Force time. I was lucky that I survived, but, uh, you know, I think it, it didn't do me any harm, physically or mentally, except for about the first six months after we returned, and then it was tough. <laughs>